We need, we need some masala. I've gone through all of the different levels of how to do this, from fighting to whatever. Uh, fighting takes too much energy. You know, I just tell them what they want to hear now. And, and, you know, you want this? You got it. You know what I mean? It's like, and, and half of them, half of the officials even know that that's what I'm doing. But it makes them safe. Because they know that what's in their rule book is, is wrong. I mean, I've had health officials in Colorado ask me for a job. Uh, so, they, so we have inherently a conventional septic system. The way I, uh, we use it as part of our uh, unconventional system. The way I uh, see it in my head is like uh, when you got a dog and it's got worms and you got a worm pill you have to give it, you put the worm pill in a ball of hamburger and the dog just yeah. woofs it down. So that's the way I deal with the regulation people, you know. Uh, I put it in a ball of hamburger and they woof it down. And it works. But still, there's, you know, the, the, there's still the process and everything. So it's like we're headed, we're aiming for projects that, I mean, I'm like, uh, I'm not trying to be a, a doomsday person or anything, but, uh, you know, for us to spend our time fighting the bureaucrats as opposed to spending our time building an earthship, it's way more important for us to build an earthship out in the boonies because the web, you know, out, we were out in the boonies in Miles City, Montana, but Jonah, my son, puts it on the web. People see it going up. They see a carbon zero building going up, going up quick, and the world sees it. And, of course, that causes, you know, I think while we were in Miles City is when the governor of the Galapagos uh, asked us to come down there. And, uh, or maybe it was, I was, I don't know, maybe it was while I was in Australia. It was just in Australia, the same thing's going on there. The, they need it desperately. They need all of these things desperately. Uh, but they're just, they, they, they get it to the certain point of recognizing they need it, and then they're hitting their brick wall of their own codes and regulations and rules. And so we're looking at trying to find pockets of freedom there. And the other thing with Australia is just like it is in this country, the place that's going to get to do it quickest is the, Maori, the uh, Aborigines. And in New Zealand, the Maoris. Uh, they say that this is the closest thing the white man has done to the way they believe. And uh, so... Uh, and it has a flat screen TV. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we're, we're now aiming our efforts at the quickest place we can do it and, and, and not giving up on the other situations. Like I've had one. See, there's, you can take all of these principles and, and, and they're, the, they're new buildings. And we could build with an army of people, and we're getting an army of people basically. Uh, we could put an army of people together building these buildings all over the world and we wouldn't scratch the surface of what uh, the number of existing buildings are. So taking these principles and applying them in what is called retrofit, to uh, uh, existing buildings is a serious issue. And uh, we're, you know, it's not near as fun as going out in the boonies and starting from scratch and throwing up a carbon zero building. It's, takes, it's a lot more mental application to try to take an existing building and, uh, and retrofit it. It's expensive as well. Uh, but we're, we're doing it and uh, attempting it. But what I'm getting at is we've got a project that's been on the books, on the drawing board and everything in uh, Long Beach, California. It's just a little half million dollar home that somebody bought and wants to turn it, add on to it and make it, uh, retrofit it to be more carbon, toward carbon zero. They can't get it absolutely carbon zero. And they're coming up against things like it is in a historic zone. And we can't even put thermal windows in it because you have to replace the windows with like kind of stuff, which is the old window weights and the old glass. I mean, it's like ridiculous. I mean, history is for history books, you know. Uh, otherwise, people are going to be history. And so it's like insane what's going on with retrofit. Uh, another, but retrofit is something like it's something to have in your minds because everybody can't build a new house. Some people are going to need to retrofit their existing house. And it's taking everything, all the principles are simply the same. 
It's the procedure and, and of, of applying them to an existing building. A way, I, I was asked to go to Norway to teach a course, but at the same time, the School of Architecture in Norway, uh, it's, it's a, the Bergen School of Architecture, and they uh, are not part of a university, they're just an architectural school. And they bought a nine-story concrete bunker grain silo uh, that still smells of rotting corn and stuff. Uh, but the architecture students are in that building. It's, it is, you know, it's weatherproof where it rains on it and it doesn't leak very much. But it's just concrete, one foot thick walls. And when I got there, it was in the winter and the students are all in jumpsuits and hats and earmuffs and gloves, sitting at their drafting tables, doing architecture, freezing. And I didn't, you know, I, I pulled out my wool hat and gloves and everything just to be able to talk to them. And so they wanted me to help them figure out how to retrofit this building. And this, this really becomes a good approach to retrofit of cities. We, we had several discussions with all kinds of professors and designers and students and everything, and it was going to be super expensive to apply all of these principles, principles to this building. But it was a nine-story building, and it did have a huge volume of space. And the concept, and it's really, that's the issue, is coming up with a concept first. The concept that we ended up with to retrofit this building was it's such a massive thing that we, we, we called it, we determined that it was not a building. We called it terrain, just like cliffs and, and uh, rock formations and whatever. So we called it terrain and we, we quit trying to retrofit the building. We just went in and made little areas like swallows build little mud nests on the overhangs of uh, Super 8 motels and stuff like that, uh, we would go in and apply all these principles to a little area. You know, this little area is warm, has a little solar panel, has a little water catchment, has plants growing, and we'd just go in like a little, little cells of cancer almost and uh, overtake this building. And, and rather than trying to retrofit the whole building, we took our space and applied all these principles to it. And so anyway, that's just another approach on retrofit because we're trying the more or less conventional approach to this house in Long Beach and it's like, it's been going on for almost a year, still don't have a permit. Uh, it's a shame, you know, that that's the way it is. But so retrofit is going to be facing the same thing that, uh, uh, that new buildings are. To, it, it, you're, you're inhibited by the uh, nature of the situation. Uh, yeah. Uh, quick question. The last time we saw on the slides of the toxicity of the fire. How does how does your whatever you put over the fire prevent the toxicity? Of the well, uh, there's two answers to that question. There's another question that probably would come up, and I'll go ahead and bring it out: is burning of the tires too. But the the tire uh, when you go to a tire store. Uh, and it's got the show window and the sun coming through the window, you walk in and you smell the rubber. You know, it's off-gassing, they call it. Uh, so a lot of people ask that question, and, and we've gotten a lot of bad press on the website and stuff about, uh, you know, this is garbage. We even, actually, we went through a period of time where we had to determine every building as a waste dump. Uh, so get a permit for dumping waste. Uh, so... <laughs> Just paperwork. But uh, so a physicist from uh, University of Wisconsin on his own volition uh, did a big thick study on running air through tires, old tires, new tires, water, and so on. And he ended up with the thought that I think his last paragraph said that living in a tire building is as about as dangerous as eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so then I would get people that said, well, if that peanut butter and jelly sandwich is on white bread, then it's dangerous. But the, so you get your sticklers for sure. But the, uh, the bottom line is he proved that he, what he came up with was that tires after they got 20,000 miles on them have done their off gassing okay. and they're not off gassing anymore. But then two, they are buried when you, when you uh, take a tire wall 
and we pack out this. You'll probably be seeing or doing some of this today. You pack out with cans and mud and cement, and then you, plast you build that out to where it's tangent with the rest of the tire, and then you plaster that. So your minimum is about an inch and a half to two inches of plaster over one place, but that grows to three, four, five, eight, ten. So you, you basically are, are burying the tire. That's a tire wall. It's buried. Even if it was off-gassing, it's sealed. But uh, they don't off-gas after they're old, and they're buried. So that is, that is a, a non-issue, but we still get people uh, worried about that. I mean, we have in the back of the Phoenix, when you go there, the tires are exposed. Uh, I mean, I don't think you'll smell anything back there. Uh, then uh, the other question that comes up a lot on tires uh, is uh, burning. You, everybody's heard about the tire piles around the world uh, spontaneously combusting, which they do. But that's because, like, a, if you take a crumpled up piece of newspaper with air all around it and everything, and you torch it with a cigarette lighter, it just goes up in flames. That's the way a tire pile is with all the tires with air all around them. Uh, they can spontaneously combust, and it's hard to put them out. But if you take paper, which is very combustible, in a New York City phone book and put a cigarette lighter to it, it doesn't, doesn't go off. It doesn't happen. That's the way a tire pounded with earth is. It's, uh, and, and that was my line, at least, that when people ask that question, that's what I told them. Well, that came true because uh, an earth ship up here in the mountains went through one of the major forest fires we've had in the last few years. And uh, the, uh, I've got pictures of it. The, the front face wood burnt off, the glass disintegrated, the roof disintegrated, everything went away except the tire walls. They were plastered and a couple of places, it wasn't a finished building, a couple of places the tires weren't plastered over and that part the rubber melted down to the steel belted stuff but wherever there was plaster on the tires uh, the tire wall they're actually going to build the building back on the same tire walls so uh, they don't burn <laughs>